Then they arrived at the country of Erasmus, which is opposite of Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order, <clears throat> order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told in the city and in the country. Then the people came out to see what had happened, and they came, when they came to see Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the foot of the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of Jerasmus asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into a boat and returned. The man from whom demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this community. We thank you for your holy word. And I pray that you would pour through me this day the word that you would have us hear. Your word, not mine. Your word, not my opinion. That will find us. That will touch us where we are, as we are. And equip us to be the people you are calling us to be. I pray this. I pray this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Do you believe in demons? We believe in sickness and mental illness, but many of us do not believe in demon possession, and yet we know the frightening reality of dynamic, demonic despair. Sinking people who sink despite everything you've tried to say and do to help. Watching something like that has to be one of the most tragic of human experiences. You know, often, what we could call a demon infects families and communities as well, such as alcoholism. Alcohol is a family illness, a contagious disease, a, a substance abuse, uh, abuse counselor once told me. The troubled man whom we know as Legion who raved at Jesus, he surely had a family, parents, perhaps a wife and children, who raved and raged with him, sometimes against him, in quietness or howling despair. Those who were made miserable through this demonic possession were legion, or many. So we all know either first or second hand about demons. And in our text today, Jesus is no well-meaning but essentially impotent presence. No, he has juice, he has power, power to defeat the demon, power to defeat our adversaries, power unleashed in compassion for the confused and the possessed. He boldly confronts those forces that bind us and, and commands them to come out of us, to leave us, to unbind us and let us go, to allow us to have some semblance of an ordered life. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at transformation. We looked at the story of Saul, who was on his way to Damascus to bring back Christians, people of the way, to Jerusalem, and how he was knocked off his horse and he was transformed, becoming an advocate, even becoming a disciple. Last week, we looked at prodigality, prodigality, 
the state of being a prodigal. And prodigality is, is someone who, who issues effusive and lavish love, like the prodigal father had for his sons, both of them. And now the man known to us as the Gerasene demoniac, he sounds like the name of an ultimate cage fighter, but he is neither a man to entertain or to admire. He's possessed by demons, and he's living in tombs in the graveyard. Clearly, the people of that country did not want to be associated with a man so possessed that they could not control him or trust him. They tried to protect him and themselves by chaining him up like a dog, but it didn't work. He was possessed by something too strong to be contained. He was too far gone to help. He roamed naked among the graves in the mountains for his family and for the community. He was probably just that, in the right place, dead. Now this occurs right after Jesus has told his disciples, he gets in a boat and he says, let's go across to the other side of the lake. It seems spontaneous. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of of access to Jesus' whimsical side. But it was during this outing that a storm came up. Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat. The disciples at first are concerned, then they're scared, then they're terrified. And they wake up Jesus and they say, don't you care that we are dying? And he gets up and he speaks to the wind and the waves and there's calm. And they look at him and they say to themselves and to each other, who is it? Who is this that even the winds and the water, they obey him? So, then they reach land and they think, ooh, here we are. The disciples still aren't sure who this man Jesus is. And then they meet someone, something, who knows exactly who Jesus is. The naked wild man falls at the feet of Jesus screaming, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? The man isn't asking for help. He's not asking for a healing. He's asking for Jesus to leave him alone. The demons who possessed him knew what the writer of the letter to the Hebrews declared. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. You see, this is a story of the unclean. Tombs are unclean. Pigs are unclean. The unclean spirit knew who Jesus was and was rightfully afraid. They have an encounter. And still, even though the spirits tried to bargain with God and they said, don't send us into the abyss, send us into those pigs over there. And Jesus complies. He sends them into the swine. And the swine are immediately crazed and run to the the cliff and are drowned. The man, on the other hand, is released. Released from his hell and the deep darkness that clouded his mind. And he's found at the foot of Jesus, dressed and in his right mind. And yet, as the townspeople gathered, they had heard about what had just happened. Having heard the stories about the amazing things taking place among the tombs and the lakeshore, and they're not happy. They relied on that herd for their livelihood. And they're afraid, like the man and the demons, they begged Jesus to leave them alone. Well, the author of Luke Acts gives us a very clear statement at the end of this tale. When Jesus gets into the boat to return across the lake, the man asks to be with him, which is a way of saying we know that the man wishes to become a follower of Jesus. But Jesus tells the man to go home, go home, just as Jesus gave the widow previously in a story back to her son, Jesus is giving the man's family back their son. The dead will be given new life. Jesus tells the man to declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus, Jesus God, had done for him. He was free. So what, according to this story, does freedom look like? First of all, true freedom requires surrender. Surrender to Jesus, letting go of those things that bind us, letting go of those things that keep us from the power and the love that will never let us go. Often we don't know or even acknowledge 
that we are bound with. We may be able to identify other people's demons or sicknesses or places of bondage. We may even be able to call out systemic or societal ills and spirits. But we are prevented by arrogance, by fear, by shame, or by the masks that we know and we wear from coming to Jesus and surrendering our whole hearts and selves to deliverance from the things that bind us. When the man falls down before Jesus, it's an acknowledgement of the power of God in him. That, men and women, is the key to freedom. Acknowledging the power, which is the power of love, displayed through our God. Second, freedom means being restored specifically to community. When a man was bound by demons, he was isolated. Then he encounters Jesus, and he's commissioned for service among his people. Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So let's recap. Jesus, the Jewish itinerant rabbi proclaiming the coming kingdom of God, goes into an unclean land to meet a man who is possessed by an unclean spirit, living in an unclean place. This is the very last place where you'd expect Jesus should be. Which, when you think about it, is where God usually shows up. At our moments of profound doubt, at our moments of profound grief and loss and defeat, and this is the one that often surprises us, among those who may, to this point, have had little interest in, let alone, our relationship with God. Now note that after this encounter, Jesus sails back home again, which may mean that the whole trek across the stormy sea and the turbulent storm and the run-in with the people of that, that land was for one reason alone, to meet someone in need. All of which suggests to me that, that there is absolutely nowhere where God is not willing to go to reach and free and sustain and heal those who are broken and despairing. So hear this, there is no place on earth that is God forsaken. And more importantly, there is no person that is God forsaken, who is beyond the reach of the loving God. No one who is so unclean, no one who is so far an outcast, abandoned, unpopular, incarcerated, unbelieving, no one is left out. And there is no indication that this Gentile man, man later became Jewish, or for that matter, Christian. He just wants to follow Jesus, but Jesus sends him back. So to put all this another way, there are no conditions to be met to receive God's love. You don't have to be wealthy or poor. You don't have to be from one ethnic group or another. You don't have to have believed your whole life or come to faith only recently or have any faith at all. You see, Jesus seeks out everyone. Even this unclean man possessed by an unclean spirit living in an unclean place and just so God loves all. Male and female and young and old and gay and straight and white and black and Asian, Latino, believers and non-believers, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, Muslim, atheist, and the list just goes on and on and on. Why? Because no one is beyond the grasp and the love of our God. So how far are we willing to go? Whom are we willing to love? In the wake of one more violent crime, of hate and terror. We need, I think, first to be reminded that God is always present, always among those in greatest pain and need. And second, that we are sent to go and do likewise. And that means God was present in Uvalde. God was present in San Diego. God was present in Oslo. God is present in Ukraine, in Yemen, and in Charleston. This is not often easy work, men and women, of course, but we take it up and we go out knowing that God is with us. Knowing that God is with us, working through us to seek out, yes, to seek out those in need, to share a word of mercy and grace, and to witness, to bear witness to the hope we have in Jesus 
the one who continues to seek us out when we feel down and out, when we are caught in the shadows and sometimes not knowing and sometimes eager for a new name, an identity, or a new day. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and let us be glad in this day. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.